My name is Lucy. Welcome to First Chapter Friday. The book that I will be reading the first chapter of today is called Drum Roll Please, and this is by Lisa Jen Bigelow. It was published in 2018, and it takes place in Michigan. So the story is told from a first-person point of view by a girl named Melissa. She goes by Melly. She lives in Kalamazoo with her parents, and she is in band at school basically because her best friend Olivia told her to be in band. So she plays the drums. Melly is pretty shy and quiet. In fact, her dad calls her Melly Mouse. Most of the book takes place at a camp in Michigan called Camp Rockaway, which is a music camp. And Melly is there because Olivia, her best friend, was also going. So Olivia plays the bass. They were hoping once they got there together, they would be in a band together. But when they get there, they find out that that's not always the way things work out. They're in the same tent, but the way that the bands are chosen at camp is not something that takes into consideration that they may get to play together. And so Melly ends up in a different group than Olivia. There's a girl in Melly's band named Adeline who Melly starts to get close to and really looks up to and just really enjoys spending time with her. Olivia starts to enjoy spending time with a boy in her band. A lot of this book is about navigating friendship and when is the right time to stand up for yourself, when is the right time to do something with or for a friend, even if it means you have to give up something you want to do. Melly is trying to figure out this world between Adeline and Olivia, while Olivia is happy to do things with Noel, assuming that Melly will be okay, but then also being sort of protective and possessive of Melly because she has always been her voice and she brought her to camp and she always speaks up for Melly. What we learn about Melly throughout this book is that she has a point at which she can be pushed too far. Another thing to mention is that right before Melly leaves for camp, like the day before, her parents spring on her that they are getting separated. This news comes to her out of nowhere. She had no idea. So that is how she's heading off to camp with that weight. It's a two week camp. There's a lot of great music played. This book talks a lot about the songs that are played. And this book is very reminiscent of being at a summer camp. There's canoeing and swimming and arts and crafts and the drama of figuring out friendship and figuring out who you like even if it is beyond what people expected of you. So here is the first chapter of Drumroll, Please. The Camp Rockaway brochure promised every kid was a rock star waiting to happen, but they never met me. We hadn't even arrived and I was ready to turn around and go home. My heart beat faster and faster like the world's worst metronome until it froze, until I couldn't feel or think or breathe. Then, just when it felt like nothing but a jumble of clockwork bits, it stuttered to life again. Mom's car zipped along the highway, billboards dwindled by the minute, farmland giving way to forest the farther north we went. In the back seat, my best friend Olivia leaned over and whispered for what had to be the fifth time. Are you sure you're okay? I shrugged. I hadn't cried in over an hour. That had to count for something, right? She squeezed my hand. You're going to get through this. Only two weeks and I'll be with you the whole time. We'll rock so hard you'll forget the rest of the world exists. I nodded. I couldn't expect Olivia to understand. She wasn't the one who'd woken up yesterday to the sweet smell of dad's homemade waffles and fresh squeezed orange juice, like it was somebody's birthday. Except it wasn't, which should have tipped me off. She wasn't the one whose parents had, at the end of breakfast, announced, we've decided we're better off apart. She hadn't shuffled like a zombie through the past 24 hours as mom took her shopping for a new swimsuit and dad scanned apartment listings on his phone. It wasn't the next two weeks I was worried about. It was the rest of my life. I knew Olivia had more to say, but we couldn't talk about anything important on the ride because mom was right there. Instead, we sang along to the radio and talked about music, which is to say, Olivia talked. She always knew who put out a new album, who was dating whom, who'd trashed a hotel room, who'd checked into rehab. She sucked up gossip like a sponge. I only half heard what she was saying. My eyes stuck on the empty seat next to mom. Dad was supposed to be sitting there singing Crazy on You in an off-key falsetto and passing around the road atlas to see who could find the funniest town names. Sweet Lips, Tennessee, or Elephant Butte, New Mexico, 
Instead, he was back in Kalamazoo looking for a new place to live. The scenery along the highway faded and I was back in the kitchen, morning sun streaming through the window. I dropped my fork with a clatter and it lay dripping syrup on the white tile floor. My tuxedo cat, Maki, licked it cautiously. We both love you very much, mom said as I stared. We want you to know you absolutely did not do anything wrong. I knew that, but you don't just wake up and say, good morning, honey, let's eat waffles and get divorced. It's not like I was expecting a drum roll, but shouldn't there have been a sign something big was coming? Where had the arguments been, the screaming, the glares, the cold shoulders, the signs that something was terribly wrong? I searched my memory and came up empty. The night before, they'd finished the crossword puzzle together. But why? I croaked. They'd exchanged a glance. Dad said, it's because, at the same time, Mom said, that's not important right now, sweetie. And we listened to seconds tick by on the clock, the one shaped like a flying chicken, with fried eggs on the hands that Dad picked out at the art fair. One summer, he'd picked it out, but Mom had laughed too, imagining it on our wall. We'd laughed so hard. How could this be, and why the day before I left for camp? Maybe I shouldn't have been so surprised about that part. My parents always had the worst timing. Like when Dad told me Grandma Goodwin was in the hospital with a fractured hip 10 minutes before my pre-algebra test. I got a D, I was so distracted. Or when I was six, and Mom slipped the truth about Santa on Christmas Eve. I cried myself to sleep and refused to open my presents in the morning. They sat wrapped under the tree until December 26th. I couldn't believe they expected me to pack my suitcase as if everything were normal. But mom said, trust me, Melly Mouse, by the time you're back home, the news will have sunk in and we'll all be ready to talk calmly and rationally about what this means for the future. Calm and rational. Like this conversation? She was like a newscaster reporting a devastating earthquake. The entire studio could be crashing down around our heads and she'd read the headlines in a pleasant voice, ignoring the dust and debris raining on her suit. At least dad looked sorry, every part of him drooping from his round shoulders to his black mustache. I knocked back my chair, sending Maki skittering from the room and stumbled, blind with tears, to the basement where my drums were. I played as hard and fast as I could, all the loudest, most likely to aggravate my parents' songs, Olivia had loaded onto my phone. My right foot on the bass drum was the boom of thunder. The hi-hat sizzled like lightning. My sticks rolled across the toms like rain on the roof, clattered across the cymbals like hail on the window. For a wonderful time, the rest of the world was washed away. There was only music with me in the eye of the storm. But in the end, when my phone died and my arms grew sore and I really had to pee, I had to climb those stairs again. Quietly, I packed my suitcase. Without drums, Melly Mouse was just that, a mouse. And now, like it or not, I was on my way to camp. Mom caught my eye in the rearview mirror. Her forehead creased. I looked away. At least she had the decency not to smile at me. We turned from the highway onto a curving country road, swooping over low hills, past marshes and prairie. Then, a few miles later, onto a bumpy dirt road lined by tall trees. Hundreds of them, thousands, placed so thick I couldn't see what lay past them. I didn't expect there to be so many trees. The words tumbled out of me. Olivia said, of course there are trees. It's camp. What were you expecting? I'm not sure. Not this, this crush of green all around us. Camp equals woods. Woods equals trees, Olivia said. I know, I said, but I've never seen trees like this. Yeah, Olivia said softer. Me neither. Neither of us had really spent time in the great outdoors. Capital G, capital O. In Kalamazoo, trees stood in well-behaved lines along the parkways and held tire swings in people's backyards. Aside from field trips to the nature center, to walk around the bog and see rehabilitated owls and turtles, the wildest place I'd ever been was the Grand Canyon, and that was about as far opposite the woods of northern Michigan as you could get. We turned once more, and the road opened up into a bright parking lot. Gravel grumbled under the tires, dust puffed up in clouds, Mom always ran early, but it seemed everyone else was just as eager. As we parked, car after car pulled in around us. I dipped my forehead against the window, staring without meaning to. I'd be here for two whole weeks with these people, and I didn't even know a thing about them. Every car was like a package on the front step. What was inside, a mystery. Olivia had already thrown open her door. I slowly followed her into the hot, muggy July air. Mom popped the trunk and started heaving luggage onto the packed dirt. A suitcase, sleeping bag, pillow, and mosquito netting for each of us, plus Olivia's bass guitar. 
Camp Rockaway provided drums, amps, and plenty of other instruments and gear, but there was no way Olivia would settle for anyone's bass but her own. It was fretless and stained the color of cherry cough drops. When Olivia's fingers danced along the neck, her dark hair swishing in time to the music, she looked like a real rock star. And that was before Camp Rockaway. My only gear was my leather stick bag, which I slung over my shoulder. Ouch, Olivia cried, hopping around and slapping at her ankle. Something bit me. Hold on, Mom said. She fumbled in her handbag and pulled out a bottle of bug spray. There was another bottle somewhere in my suitcase. Olivia squirted herself. The air was thick with the sound of bugs I didn't recognize. I knew the whine of mosquitoes, the buzz of house flies. This was a whole orchestra. It hummed in my ears, pulsed in my brain. My skin vibrated like the skin of a drum. My fingers flexed as if grasping imaginary sticks. For the first time in over a day, I forgot what was going on at home. Mom waved the bug spray at me. You'd better put some on too, Melly. At her voice, I remembered everything and frowned. As I rubbed repellent on my arms and legs, I watched a white taxi cab roll into the lot and lurch to a stop. It looked out of place amid the minivans and SUVs. A girl with tawny brown skin and dark brown hair braided into rows jumped out of the passenger seat. The driver opened the trunk. He pulled out a large duffel bag, bedding, mosquito netting, and an acoustic guitar. It was in a cheap case, the black cardboard kind, covered with stickers. Who came to camp in a taxi? Where were her parents? The girl handed the driver money and shook his hand, as if it were an everyday thing for her. As she turned from him, she saw me watching. She smiled at me, a big, braces flashing smile. I blushed and looked away. I needed a shirt for times like this. It would say, don't mind me, I'm just socially awkward. I handed the bug spray back to my mother. No, you keep it, Mom said. If it's this buggy all the time, I want you to have extra. The girl from the taxi walked past us. I sneaked a look at the stickers on her guitar case. Peace, love, music, more cowbell, WUPX, the pulse of the UP. This machine kills fascists. I didn't get that one at all. I remembered from our World War II unit that Mussolini was a fascist, but I couldn't remember how he died. Still, I was pretty sure it had nothing to do with guitars. It didn't seem possible she could carry all her luggage at once, but there was her duffel across her back, there were her sleeping bag and netting in one hand, her guitar case in the other. If she felt weighted down by all that stuff, you couldn't tell. She looked as carefree as if she were carrying a bundle of balloons, as if she had only to wish it, and she'd skim across the parking lot, her toes barely stirring up swirls of dust. I couldn't help staring as she floated by. A small voice inside me said, remember, your life is in pieces. You shouldn't be here. You should be at home under the covers crying, but another voice chanted louder, merging with the chorus of bugs in the trees. Forget, forget, forget. And that's the end of chapter one of Drumroll, please. It's a small introduction to Olivia and Melly and the way that their friendship works, and a small introduction to who we learn very soon is Adeline. And there's a little bit of mystery surrounding her. Why did she arrive in a taxi? What do the stickers on her guitar case mean? And all of that and more is revealed as these three characters and many others navigate two weeks at a music camp, navigate friendship and other relationships, and play music. And it's a really great book. It's fun to read because of the music, but it says some really, really important things about how to be a good friend and how to receive friendship as well. I highly recommend that you read Drumroll, Please by Lisa Jen Bigelow. Thank you for joining me.